schemata is action for physical activity recognition. Um, taking uh, wirelessly 
this, this data, this information. So, of course, there may be some of this data which is dropped off because of connectivity problems. And what we have done is estimate that missing value from the rest of the, of the, of the values, okay? So this is the pre-processing stage, and the next stage we will perform signal segmentation. For signal segmentation, what we, what we have done is we have defined a sliding window across the instances that we have, across our raw data. And for that, for each of that window, which has a size of 512 instances, we have computed the discrete Fourier transform. Uh, concretely, we have used uh, the fast Fourier transform algorithm because of efficiency. And when we have computed the, the DFT, what we have done is that we have an output of 512 um, uh, values, again, and we have computed a statistical summary. So basically we have computed several, uh, seven, seven statistics, which are the mean, the median, the standard deviation or variance, uh, the maximum, minimum, and two percentiles. And by doing this, what we have is that we have transformed our original data, which was in the, in the time domain, into the frequency domain. So an instance before uh, was representing a certain point in time for, for the sensors, and right now it has a summary, a statistical summary, of uh, the 512 like uh, last point in time, okay? The, now, the next step involves feature extraction, and this is actually uh, mm, the core of our work, okay? After performing this, the signal segmentation, we have a resulting set of 280 features. This is not a huge dimensionality. Uh, it's, it, it, I mean, it's relatively medium-sized, but we think we can reduce it. And by reducing it, we can gain in performance in two different senses. The first sense is that we can, of course, reduce the time for training a classifier and for uh, performing classification. And the second is that we can gain uh, in accuracy by removing uh, features or attributes that are not required or are not useful. So, of course, as we have 280 features, we can model this as a binary optimization problem. For instance, we, can, uh, we could uh, take a binary string of, of size 280, and where, uh, whereas a 1 means that the attribute is considered for the classification and a 0 means that the attribute or the feature is dropped off and is not considered. And we could use any standard state-of-the-art technique for, for binary optimization problems, such as, for instance, a genetic algorithm. Uh, the fitness function we will define is the accuracy of a random forest classifier. We'll see later why. And I must say here that we have used a local per subject optimization. Uh, wh what this means is that we have um, optimized a set of features for each different subject, okay? Of course, we don't want uh, a, a subject-oriented classifier, rather we want a general-purpose classifier, but we'll see later how we have uh, moved from this local optimization into a global optimum, okay? Um, so now let's talk about how do we perform this uh, binary uh, optimization problem, how, how do we solve this task? And uh, I said before we could use any kind of technique, for instance, uh, genetic algorithms, but we have used a technique uh, which was introduced by Pedro Isassi and, and Bernard Mandry last year, which is called Monte Carlo Schemata Searching. And uh, Monte Carlo Schemata Search is um, basically a variation uh, of uh, Monte Carlo tree search, but the nodes of the tree are not states in a game, for instance, such as is the case of MCDS, but rather are binary strings which represent the schemas. A schema is a binary string which can contain this kind of star symbol, a wildcard. And a wildcard can take either a value of 1 or a 0 indistinctly, okay? So a schema, um, a schema is basically a binary string with that kind of wildcard sim uh, symbol which can represent uh, either a 1 or a 0. So a schema can represent several individuals, okay? A set of individuals. Uh, for our algorithm, we start with the root of the tree, which is um, the most general schema, which is, of course, uh, a binary string containing all, um, in this case, 280 stars or wildcards, okay? So that represents all possible set of, of individuals, of solutions. And then, what we have done, of course, when we start, we just have the root, and we know that we have to span the root, okay? But when we have an, a tree, an arbitrary uh, tree, uh, which may be unbalanced, we have to choose which node is the one that we are going to expand next. And for that, what we are going to, to do is compute which of all these, these nodes is the most promising. So we'll uh, compute this function here. By the way, a k here means the kth node, and sk means the schema represented by that node in the tree. Okay, so we compute that function, m of sk, of sk which um, computes a trade-off between exploitation and exploration. This exploitation function, this importance function, we're going to see later how it is computed. And exploration, basically, what it's doing is trying to um, promote those nodes uh, who have not been uh, evaluated too much times. Basically, this value here, to simplify, is the number of, of times that, did that a certain node 
is, uh, has been evaluated. Uh, so when this is small, this means that uh, the node has, uh, has not been evaluated too much times, and this value is bigger. And this C is basically a parameter uh, which may be tuned in order to give more importance to exploration or exploitation. When we have uh, selected a node, uh, what we do is that we generate its descendants. The descendants of a node are schemas which are more uh, particular uh, than, the, than the parent. Okay? Of course, if we have very long schemas, we may have a lot of descendants. So actually, we don't really need to generate all possible descendants. Okay? We may focus just on generating a random subset of, of descendants. And once we have generated a set of descendants, what we do is we simulate. We simulate. And in this simulation, what we will uh, do is we um, generate a random, random individuals which fit, which stick to that schema, and we evaluate the fitness for them. If you remember, the fitness we said before was, this is the fitness of an individual, which was the, um, the, um, um, the result, the accuracy, uh, obtained using a random forest classifier. And what we do here is, okay, we have a, a set of individuals generated randomly, which adhere to a certain schema, and what we do is we compute the average uh, accuracy, and that's this value, B of SK, okay? And once uh, we have that, that is the importance value the first time we, um, uh, we evaluate a node, okay? If you remember previously, we saw that for the exploitation phase, we computed this value, F of, uh, F of uh, SK, and this value, what we are going to do is that, of course, the first time, the first time we evaluate a node, this t is going to be zero, and this, this value is going to be one. So we just take this value here, okay? We remove this, and this is a division by one, so we have this value, b of sk. So it's the, the fitness we have said before. But over time, what we are going to do is we are going to back propagate the evaluations through the node up to the root, and we are going to, uh, to consider both the previous values of the importance of each node and the new values computed for the new uh, descendants. Okay, so eventually this will converge to a, to a solution by expanding the node uh, until a certain um, stop condition is, is achieved. And finally we will have a, a, a solution, okay, uh, which may be of course a not a um, global optimum, but it is expected to be a local optimum. And after we have eight different solutions, one per each subject, as we said before, we want to have a um, global solution, okay, for a global classifier, a subject independent classifier. So what we do now is we define a threshold, tau, so that, and this is uh, quite simple, uh, we have eight different uh, binary strings, eight different solutions, one for each subject, and what we will do is that for final solution, we will take an attribute, a y, only if it appears at least in tau strings, in tau individual solutions, okay? So from this, uh, using this procedure, we move from eight different um, local solutions to a global solution. Uh, in the end, we have a binary string which uh, contains mm, uh, certain attributes and removes other attributes. And with that, we can already perform classification. We try different techniques, uh, for instance, uh, night base and decision trees, but we saw that the best results were achieved using a uh, random forest classifier. That's the reason why we uh, used for the, after a preliminary evaluation, we decided to use random forest classifier also for the fitness computation. So let's take a, a look at the results. First of all, uh, we can see how the number of features evolve with the value of tau. Of course, it is expected that as the threshold increase, the number of features decrease significantly. And what we can see is that with uh, a value of tau of 1, we have 290 features, and with a value of tau of 8, we have only 4 features. Okay? Uh, here we can see the results obtained during the local optimization process, uh, the Monte Carlo, uh, the Monte Carlo schemata search optimization. And we can see that the results are quite good, and in some cases, they even approach quite much to to 100%. But of course, this is tricky, because uh, this is a um, local optimization. So basically, we have um, an algorithm which has optimized, uh, which has specified, or uh, has overfitted a certain subject, okay? And we don't want this. So after global optimization, we have the results here. Uh, we have used a technique, which is also uh, explained by uh, Ray and Stricker in the original paper, which is leave one subject out cross-validation. This basically means that we train a classifier with seven subjects and test with the other subject, so that we are uh, trying to guarantee that there is no bias in the classifier um, uh, overfitting a certain subject, as it, as it happens in the local optimization. So here we have eight columns, one for each subject, 
and we have eight rows, eight, uh, one for each different value of tau, and we can see the results for each different subject. Uh, and, it, and if we look at, take a look at the average, uh, the average accuracy, we can see that the best result is 93.74%, which is at, uh, achieved with a value of tau equals two. But more interestingly, we can see that when tau equals five, we have a value which is 93.17%, okay? And this is interesting because if we take a look at the number of features for each value of tau, we see that when tau equals five, we have 102 features. So that means that we have gone from 280 features to 102, so it's probably um, a, a bit more than a third of the, of the original features. And the result is still of a 93.17%, which is quite close, within 0.6 uh, percentile point from the best solution. And this is interesting because we have reduced significantly the, the number of features. Okay? And also the results, uh, they, are, they are not, well, they are not at least here in the, in the presentation, but are a bit uh, higher uh, than those uh, obtained by Reis and Stricker, because they achieve between an 89 and 91% of accuracy and we have a 93 to 17%. So as a conclusion, uh, we, have, we have seen that there is an increasing interest in physical activity recognition because of different factors. And we have described the activity recognition change, uh, chain as a sequence of steps to be performed uh, to carry out this task. We have used the PAMAP uh, dataset, which is publicly available at uh, UCI Machine Learning Repository. We have performed basic preprocessing, then we have um, compute the dis uh, discrete Fourier transform in order to uh, convert this signal from the time domain to the frequency domain. We have used this technique, Monte Carlo Schemata Search, which was introduced by Pedro Isassi and, and Bernard Mandery uh, in order to perform binary optimization of the solutions. And after classification, we have achieved an accuracy of over 93%. Uh, there is some future work which can be carried out to improve this paper. The first of all, we can optimize not, um, not features, but sensors directly. This has two main advantages. The first one is that we can reduce the search, the search space because there are less sensors than features, okay? And we can also reduce cost because if we know that the sensor is not required at all, when we build this kind of uh, wearable devices, we can not include, uh, we can uh, decide to not include that sensor because they are worthless and then uh, we are optimizing cost, okay? Uh, we can perform a global optimization from the very beginning and this is a very interesting uh, future work which we are already working in. Uh, but the main disadvantage is that it's more time consuming because payments require, uh, require much more time, okay? And, but, we are, uh, but we expect to have um, better results, higher accuracy. And finally, uh, it will be interesting to try uh, this system, this activity recognition system, using um, wearable devices. Because even when we, uh, w we may expect that the accuracy is lower because uh, those sensors are not as specific as other uh, sensors placed uh, across the body, uh, it is much more convenient and comfortable for users because a user uh, normally uh, will not uh, wear ad hoc sensors all the day, but it is m more common that they can wear a wristband like this one uh, 24 hours a day. And that's all. Uh, I just want to acknowledge uh, the European Commission because it was a, this is um, the result from an European, uh, well, one of the results uh, from an European project, which is uh, SEACW, uh, which is which uh, tries to promote uh, active and healthy aging across. Uh, uh, European population, and this project was co-funded by, by this entity. So thank you uh, uh, very much for your attention, and if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask me. Thank you. So any questions?
they ask you to do so in your experience, so we have done, of course. And, and so we follow really what is, um, really the, the core of this work, as I said before, is feature extraction, because uh, preprocessing and segmentation is quite similar to what they do, to what Ray and Schrieger do in their experiments also. And our, it's really, uh, it really has no, a lot of uh, place to innovate here. Uh, there are no too much room to, for innovation here. Uh, so we have used very standard techniques, and all the core uh, of our work is really has to do with, with binary optimization of features and uh, Monte Carlo schematic cells for this task. And the same different case that you scale up is uh, also solved by the Sorry, the scaling up is uh, used. Scaling up. Uh, well, in this case, in this case, as we have uh, 280 features, uh, we did uh, we don't really know how this scales up when we have more features. For instance, if we had a problem of uh, uh, of feature selection when we have millions of attributes, for instance, we don't know yet how this method performs. Okay. Uh, so as I said before, uh, 280 is not really a huge dimensionality. It's not a lot of features. Uh, we could, yeah, we could use a random forest directly over the 280 features, and we get good results. Also, I mean, uh, results are almost as good as when Tau was too. Uh, but yeah, it is an interesting. Um, future work to see how this method, this particular method, scales out when you have more features or longer binary strings. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, thank, thank you very much. So, well, uh, the next presentation, the author is... Uh,